Now I've entitled a sermon today, Justice and Mercy Reveal in the Character of God. If we, if the individual focuses more on the merciful side of God, that's an imbalance. If the individual focuses more on the judgment side of God, it's still an imbalance. So it's so important that we have a balanced approach of justice and mercy in our characters because when Christ comes and he looks at his church, who do you want to see? You want to see himself in his church. We must reflect in our characters God, justice, and mercy. Amen? So, as I deliver the word today, I'm asking for your presence. I'm asking for the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. <coughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, again, we are again so truly thankful and grateful for our spared lives. Thankful for life. Thankful for your wonderful and many blessings. Thankful for your goodness, your kindness, your love, your mercy, your grace. Most of all, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ and his precious, precious blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And Father, as I'm about to deliver the word that you have placed in my heart, I'm asking that I will decrease and Christ will always increase. And we will be careful to give you all the praise, the glory and honor we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our sermon today begins in eternity. In a loving, peaceful, happy environment where love reigns supreme. Love for God and his intelligent created beings and love among the angelic hosts reign in abundance. Love among cherubims and seraphims reigned in abundance. But a change came upon this once peaceful atmosphere when Lucifer, the anointed cherub, the highest of God's created being, began to sow seeds of doubt and mistrust in the hearts and the minds of the angelic host. He insinuated doubt, mistrust in the hearts of the angelic host, brothers and sisters. He saw such a subtle seas of and asked questions, is God truly a God of love? Is God truly a just God? He insinuated doubts and mistrust in the hearts of the angelic hosts. He launched an attack on the character of God, insinuating that God is a tyrant, a dictator, a control freak, and if anyone goes against his will and his command, they will be immediately destroyed. These were some of the subtle tactics that Lucifer used to gain sympathizers in the great controversy between good and evil in heaven. But in the depths of his heart, saints of God, he had a deep-rooted jealousy for Jesus and the position that he held. He envied Jesus' position, but not his character. So the great controversy between good and evil has absolutely nothing to do with you and me. But it has everything to do with the character of God because God himself was placed on trial before the whole universe. God's government or his character was under attack and it was all over this question, is God a just God or not? Satan managed to convince Adam and Eve that God is unjust. And they saw the whole human race into sin and rebellion against God. They saw their whole prosperity into the hands of Satan. But since the question must be answered in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Is God love? Is God just? Is God good, brothers and sisters? The question must be answered. Or is he a liar? Is he a deceiver? Is he unjust? Is his government defective and needed change or needed to be changed or altered? 
But I'm just here to declare unto you, saints of God, I'm just here to remind you that the God we serve, he is love. Amen? The God we serve, he is good. He is holy and he's a just God, saints of God. Amen? And we can put our complete trust in him, brothers and sisters. And when I say just, I'm talking about he is fear. He is reasonable. Satan accused God of being two-faced. Because another powerful, powerful argument or charge that Satan brought against the government of God was that, that, is that justice was inconsistent with mercy. The pen of inspiration declares, listen carefully, saints. At the very beginning of the conflict between good and evil, Satan had declared that it was impossible to obey the law of God. He claimed it was, it was hard and too rigid. Satan also declared that justice was inconsistent with mercy. And that if the law of God were once broken, it was impossible for the sinner to receive forgiveness. He also declared that if God were to cancel the punishment for sin, he would not be a God of justice. And when Adam and Eve first rebelled against the law of God or broke the law of God, Satan declared that their disobedience was proof that it was impossible for them to keep the law of God. And listen, and mankind could not be forgiven. Satan didn't want mankind to receive forgiveness. Because he and his angel were cast out of heaven after their rebellion, he claimed that the human race must be shut out forever from God. God's favor. God could not be just. He argued and yet showed mercy to the sinner. Now let's examine the character of God. The Bible says that God is just. He's tender-hearted, full of mercy and truth. He is gracious and full of compassion. This is the character of God, saints of God. The Bible in John 4, 1 John 4 said that he that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. So everything about God is love. His existence. His presence, even his aroma, saints of God, it's all his love. And then justice and judgment are the inhabitants of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face, Psalms 89. So with God, there's this divine balance between justice and judgment, mercy and truth. Let's turn our Bibles quickly to Exodus chapter 34. Verse 5 to 7. Let's be examining, examining the character of God of justice and mercy or mercy and justice. Let's turn the Bible to Exodus 34 verse 5 to 7. <clears throat> and the Bible says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him. They are talking about Moses. And proclaim the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So here we see a loving and a merciful son of God. But then it goes on to say that. And that he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Here we see justice in the character of God. So with God, there's this divine balance between justice and mercy. And brothers and sisters, we can preach on any aspect of God's character, from his love to his mercy to his justice to his forgiveness of sins and his transgression, we can preach about all of the sins of God. And then, and then we can preach about uh, on sin and iniquity and lawlessness, his justice 
and judgment. So when we think about God being a merciful and a gracious God, it means that he doesn't deal with us after our sins deserve or he does not reward us according to our iniquities. Amen? Because if God was to deal with us according to our sins, brothers and sisters, none of us would be standing here today. Amen? So we have to thank God for him being a merciful and a gracious God. And when we think about him being long-suffering saints of God, and knowing that where we were and some of us where we came from, knowing the lifestyle that some of us used to live, that I used to live saints of God, and yet he has been patient towards us, and he's not willing that any should perish, that all may come to re repentance, proves that he is a God that's long-suffering. God is desperate to save every human being on planet called earth sins of God. Keeping mercy for thousands means that he is a covenant, he's a covenant keeping God, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. We all rightfully deserve of eternal death for our transgression, but God, because of his love and because of his mercy and because he loves the world so much. He has given to us a second chance and whoso, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it doesn't stop there. Because the God we serve is also a God of justice and judgment. And he will no wise clear the guilty or the transgressions of his law. And this is not the guilt of a judge pronouncing one guilty. But this guilt deals specifically when God offers the sinner mercy or an opportunity to escape the justice of his law and he refused to turn from his evil, wicked way, sins of God, and desire to live a lifestyle of rebellion to his will and his command, brothers and sisters. He will in no means clear the guilty. He will visit the iniquities of the fathers unto the children, upon the children's children, and on, even unto the third and fourth generation. Because the justice of God's broken law demands the life or the blood of the sinner. Now it was Satan's intention to separate justice from, from mercy or to divorce Justice and mercy, brothers and sisters. But brothers and sisters, when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, we saw justice and mercy in his fullness, saints of God. Because the justice of the law fell upon Christ, whilst at the same time he provided mercy for the sinner. Amen? Amen. We got to thank God for him being a wonderful, merciful God. Because the Bible says, mercy and truth met together Rational and peace have kissed each other at the cross of Calvary. Any attempt to separate justice from mercy is a direct attack upon the character of God. <coughs> See, I've gotten to realize even with our understanding of God's character, the devil has sought to distort God's character. Even the way in which we present the gospel sometimes is in a distorted, mixed up version of the gospel. Because there are those, when they are presenting the gospel, they tend to focus more on the loving, merciful side of God's character, which symbolically is a far left position. They tend to focus more on the merciful side of God's character. And from this belief comes a, a once always saved gospel. And that God is so merciful that he does not destroy. A happy-go-lucky religion, brothers and sisters, it gives way to liberalism, um, cold formalism, a religion where everything goes because God is so merciful and God is so loving that there is no punishment for sin and no consequences to one's action, and we all will make it to heaven. This is what happens when, when we veer to the far left. But on the flip side, 
Then there are those who go to the extreme right. And they only see God and God of justice and judgment and without no mercy. And this gives birth to legalism, extremism, fanaticism, a fear-based religion. Some only want to hear judgment messages. Some only want to hear hellfire messages. Some only want to hear about the Pope and the mark of the beast. So meanwhile, the heart is destitute of the love of God and the heart is cold. You see, the gospel is a revelation of the character of God to, the, to, you, to us human beings. It reveals a God who is unwilling to punish the guilty sinner. But well, God has put the guilt and the weight of sin upon his son that we, the guilty race, can be set free. Moreover, the plan of salvation was laid before God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God made the first move. Inspiration declared. It was for angels. It was for unfallen world as well as for us that Christ had accomplished the great work of redemption on behalf of the human race. It wasn't for us alone. It was for the whole universe. It reveals a God who is loving. It reveals a God who is compassionate. It reveals a God who is merciful and tender-hearted towards the fallen race. And, he, and, and we saw how God dealt mercifully with David when he was rightfully deserving of death after his sin against Uriah and his sin against Bathsheba. You see, Brother James, it was a time of ease in the life of David. At a time when he was surrounded with the fruits of victory and the honor of his wise and able rule. It was a time of ease and self-security. That, and It was at this time of ease and self-security that he let go of his hold upon Jehovah. And it was this time of ease that prepared the way for his fall. It was at this time of ease that David yielded to the subtle temptation of the devil and brought upon his soul the guilt and the stain of sin. He was the leader of the children of Israel, chosen by God to execute his law, but he fell a prey to the power of the devil. He fell a prey to the seductive, bewitching power of the devil. Now, the, the Bible describes David as a faithful man, one who executed judgment and justice, a man after God's own heart, saints of God, Let's turn our Bibles, let's turn our Bibles quickly to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's pick up the story here. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And verse 1. And the Bible says it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go, all, go to fort, fort battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Ramah. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of his house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came unto him and lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. It seems like Bathsheba was kind of light-headed, brothers and sisters. A woman, please, don't allow yourself to be a Bathsheba. 
please. I don't care how tall he is. I don't care how handsome he is or how charming or how powerful he is or how, or how good he can preach or how good he can expound on God's word or how much money he makes. You say no to the devil. Amen? You say no to the devil. Now, David committed an act of adult, adult, uh, <coughs> adultery, right? And if David thought that he would have done this adulterous act and get away with his brothers, says sometimes our sin will take us a little further. Sometimes sin is going to take us a little deeper. Sometimes it's going to stay a little longer than we wanted it to stay. Because what? Because Bathsheba got pregnant and she sent and told David that I am having a baby. Let's see. Bathsheba and David was having a baby. The beauty of Bathsheba was a snare to King David and he made the fatal error. Sometimes when the devil can't get the good man to yield to his subtle temptation, oftentimes he is highly, highly successful when he uses a woman. Such is the powerful woman. For many strong men have been slain by her. Yeah, but you see, if Uriah, if Uriah had only found out that David made his wife pregnant, or got his wife pregnant, the law of God pronounced death upon the idolatry. And Uriah had every right to avenge or to take the life of David, brothers and sisters. Or if he made this thing known to the nation, he could inspire a rebellion in the country, saints of God. Sin has long-lasting consequences and devastating consequences. Now, David, in an order to cover up his sin, inspiration declare every effort which was made by him to conceal his guilt proved unavailing. He had betrayed himself into the power of Satan. The angels surround him. Dishonor more bitter than death was before him. There appeared no way to escape. And in his desperation, he hurried on to add murder to adultery. Satan whispered, kill Uriah. Satan had caused the death of King Saul, the first king of Israel. Now the destroyer was seeking the life and the blood of David, the second king of Israel. Now let us examine the character of Uriah. In 2 Samuel chapter, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 6. Let's examine the character of Uriah. The Bible says that David sent for Uriah. And when Uriah came to him, David demanded of him, of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. David decided to send Uriah down to his home, but Uriah refused to go home because Uriah was one of those soldiers who was always on duty. He never took days off, saints of God. He refused to go home to his house. Um, 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 and, and Uriah did not go down to his house. And when they told David that Uriah did not go down to his house, David sent a call of Uriah and he said, didn't you come from a long journey? Why didn't you go down into your house? This is the character of Uriah, says of God. But Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Je 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 um, Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped on, 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 on in open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, as, as thou so livest, I will not do this thing. This Uriah was a faithful soldier, saints of God. One who was always on duty. 
And they even had crystal clear evidence that this was one of his most fearful and bravest soldiers. He should have even thought about murdering Uriah. But Satan whispered, kill Uriah. Kill Uriah. Kill Uriah. Because after all, that man tell no tales. And yielded to the power of the devil. So David now invited Uriah to come spend a couple of days with him. He made him eat. He made Uriah drink. He made him marry. He even made him drunk. And I remember the old, people's, the old people used to get the animals and fatten it before they kill it. For I remember a long time in Christmas, they used to get the, the animals and fatten them before they kill it. And poor Uriah, he didn't know that David was just fattening him for the kill. At uh, this dark point in David's life, he was not a man after God's own heart, but he was under the power of Satan. Now the Bible says, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And Uriah didn't know that in his hands he had his own death sentence. He didn't know in his hands he had his own death warrant. But, but David knew that he was fearful enough that he was not going to open that letter. Sometimes, sometimes people can try to use your own faithfulness against you, saints of God. He wrote in a letter saying, Set Uriah in front of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. I remember a former client of mine, a former Vietnam vet. He said, during the Vietnam War, the black soldiers went through a very similar experience. Because they will send the black soldiers in the forefront of the hottest battles, brothers and sisters. Where they know that the valiant men were the Viet Congs were. He also said that um, if they believe that their commanding officer was sending them into hostile territory, he said, man, we will turn around and kill him. And that make it appear like enemy fire, saints of God. Why you nothing to play with? And after all, Uriah was a Hittite. He wasn't an Israelite. So sometimes it's easier to send another man of another country, another race into the forefront of the hottest battle. And so the Bible says that the shooter shut off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants dead, and, and, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Poor Uriah, he didn't even know why he died. He was just being faithful to God and he died sins of God. And because of his faithfulness of, to God, I expect to see you read the Hittite in the first resurrection. Amen? Amen? Now, it was the spirit of self-preservation was why David was attempting to cover up his own adulterous, covetous ways. He planned, premeditated, and executed the murder of one of his most faithful soldiers. He killed Uriah the Hittite. And not only did Uriah die, but other fearful men died as well. Other families suffered as a result of the decision that David made, brothers and sisters. Sin has devastating consequences, sins of God. Now, all David had to simply do, he got caught in adultery. Right? All he had to simply do was to go on his knees and tell it to Jesus. Amen? All you have to just, all you have to do is let the Lord know that he got caught in adultery. Go down on his knees and pray and rest with God and ask him to deliver him from this valley of shadow of death. Because the Lord know how to deliver the ungodly. Deliver him from the power of Satan. But instead, he trusted in his own self for deliverance sins of God. And as a result, he plunged himself deeper and deeper into the power of Satan. And every time we try to deliver ourselves from the power of Satan, sins of God, we will make a bad situation worse, sins of God. We will make a bad situation worse. And Mr. David couldn't even wait for the body to get cold. 
Because the Bible says early the next morning, he went and he got Bathsheba and he married Uriah, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Have mercy, Lord. I know something, sometimes we do a wrong and we think we can live happily ever after. But oh no, the Bible said the way of the transgression is hard. And the thing was David did this please the Lord greatly. It didn't escape the eyes of the Lord. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to escape the searching eyes of the Lord. We, for what we do in secret shall be proclaimed from the house of brothers and sisters. So let us be very, very careful. You see, Sister Peters, God sent Nathan. God always has faithful men in every generation to reprove sin, sins of God. God sent Nathan to reprove David of his sin against Uriah. And Nathan didn't just come blasting fire and brimstone at, um, at, at, at David. He didn't just start condemning him, sins of God. But what he did, he simply gave him a parable of oppression and an injustice done to someone to arouse the conscience of, of David and let David cast judgment upon his own self. He used heaven-born wisdom. And sometimes we got to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as dove evil when condemning sin and sinners. He gave him the story of a rich man and a poor man. 2 Samuel 12. The rich man had exceeding many flock and herd. And the poor man had just one ewe lamb. And there came a traveler unto the rich man. And he didn't even take off his exceeding great flock to entertain his guests. But he went and took off the only, only lamb that the poor man had. You see, this parable appealed to David because as a child, he was a shepherd. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, the man that doeth this thing shall surely die. Thank you. The man that doeth this thing shall surely die. Okay. The man that does this thing shall surely die. And there are those who are just like David. Because we are so quick to see the speck in everybody else's eye and don't know that we got a beam in our own eyes, saints of God. So in 2 Samuel chapter 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16, to my mother-in-law. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Yes. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I am not thee king over Israel, and I deliver thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wife into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And if and if that had been too little, I would more have given unto thee such and such things. Up to twelve is it? Yeah. Up to Where ten. Go? Him. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with his sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite yeah. to be thy wife. Amen. Thank you, mommy. Thank you. Amen. So David something in the eye of sin against the Lord. So in other words, David at that point felt convicted of sin. He felt the guilt and the condemnation of sin, which demands the life of the sinner and there is no escape. But here what happened. The good news is that Nathan said unto David, the Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shall not die. Wait, but wait, wait. What happened here? Something strange here. Did David repent? 
Did we say they ever repent? No. But the Lord forgave him, right? Okay. Did David repent before the Lord forgave him for sin? Answer me, saints of God. No, he didn't. So here we see an aspect of God's pardoning grace before the sinner even repents. David was deserving of death, but before he even repented, the Lord frankly forgave him. Because he was going to hold, hold that sin against his son. Inspiration declared, yet justice must be maintained. The sentence, justice of the law must be maintained. The sentence of death was transferred from David to the child of his sin. Thus the king was given an opportunity to repent. So the curse of David's sin fell upon the innocent, his innocent son and the child died. Likewise, Jesus Christ, who is also the son of David, he bore the brunt of the curse for us. He was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was lacerated and hung upon the cross of Calvary for our sins. The innocent son of God died for our sins, sins of God. The curse or the condemnation of the law fell upon the innocent son of the living God. The innocent died for the guilty. The justice of the Lord fell upon him and we the guilty race was set free. Oh, the mysteries of redemption. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The songwriter says, oh, what wondrous love is this that called the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Amen. The Bible says it is the goodness of the Lord that leads thee to repentance. David fell under the justice of the divine law of God and was rightfully deserving of eternal death. But mercy and grace says no. And as a result of God's mercy towards him, we find a powerful, powerful response to the goodness of the Lord in Psalms 51. Amen? Amen? Amen. This was David's response to God's goodness. Amen. The fact that he was deserving of eternal death. Amen. But Christ took the brunt and the guilty sinner was set free. Amen. This here gives us an example of true repentance True humility and true sorrow for sin. Let's turn our Bible to Psalm 51. And so the Bible says, this is David's cry to the Lord. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from thine iniquities. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in sin and iniquity. I was shaped, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop that I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9. Hide thy face from thy sins and blot out my transgression. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. David wasn't only praying, praying for pardoning and cleansing, but he was praying for purity of heart. Amen. And that's the blessing to all repentant sinners. Amen. In verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I'll stop there. This was David's response that he was deserving of death, but before he even could open his mouth to say, Lord, have mercy on me, the Lord had forgiven him. Mercy. Now, Sister James.
Justice said that David must die. But grace and mercy says no. Give the sinner, the sinner a second chance. So at the end of this dark chapter in David's life, he can confidently declare, blessed are, who, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and, and, and whose sin are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He can confidently declare that God is good, that God, that God is love and God is just, and he's a justifier of all those who come unto him to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and to those who confidently declare that you must first repent before you can be justified before God. Or you must first repent before confess your sin before you can be forgiven. Or the, the individual must first bring a lamb before they can be forgiven. By the way, even though you was bringing a lamb, who provided the lamb? The Bible said God will provide himself a lamb. He told Abraham. This story of David's life Refute the argument that you gotta, you got to repent first. Because here we see very clearly that David was forgiven before he even asked for forgiveness. And if God has done this for one who coveted after a man's wife, and if he has done this for an adulterer and a murderer, don't you think he can do the same for you or me? Amen. Don't you think he can do the same for the whole world? You see, the sin here now is because we have been forgiven. You see, Lucifer in heaven committed the unpardonable sin, which is a total, final rejection of God and his government. And that's the sin he wants every human being to commit. Yes, he wants us to reject what Christ has done for us at the cross of Calvary. All right. Some still don't believe. Let's, ex ex let's examine the character of God a little bit further. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> we examine, we are taking a deeper look at the character of God towards sin and sinners. <clears throat> now don't leave here thinking I'm saying that because God has forgiven us that there is no punishment. The sin now is rejecting what Christ has done for us. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 and th verse 5. Somebody read this. Mother-in-law, read this for me, please. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 44. Stand up, stand up my mother-in-law. <laughs> you have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and, and hate thy enemy. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that wish despise and abuse you and persecute you. Amen. That you may be that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he or he may get his son to rise. Okay, mommy. Okay. Thank you very much, man. Thank you very much. So this is the spirit of Christ, saints of God. To love those that hate you. Alright? He maketh the sun to rise upon the good and the evil. The good and the bad. The just and the unjust. This is the spirit of Christ. The blessing has been bestowed upon all men. Verse 46. If you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? In verse 40, he says, Ye therefore be perfect, be ye perfect, therefore, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. So the fact that God bestows his blessing upon all humanity is a sign of his perfection, and we ought to strive to be like him in character. Now we see the very same principle in the invitation of the gospel. The Bible in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. For why we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely shall a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded in love towards us, in that, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Jesus did not, Jesus didn't just die in time. Jesus died in eternity. It was just manifested in the fullness of time. In verse 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, one by one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon what? All men. Brothers and sisters, this is the spirit of Christ and the invitation of the gift, the, the gospel. The, the forgiveness has been given to all men. But we got to convince them that they have been forgiven. Yes. That's our challenge. Yes. We have been justified. We have been acquitted. Again, the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God who have reconciled us unto, him, unto himself by Jesus Christ and are given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We have to tell the world that they have been reconciled. That's our mission, saints of God. To wait that, Christ, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world unto himself. Not imputing trespasses unto them, but had committed unto us the word, the, the word of reconciliation. The Bible in Isaiah 40, 44 and verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me. For I have redeemed these sins of God. What kind of God is this we serve? What an amazing, merciful God. Just think about the sins of God. Just think about it. When a God who is just, because the whole controversy is, either, is God is just God or not. When a God who is just, think about its sins. Wait for you to first come to him before he forgive you? Or will a just God forgive you before you even think about coming to him? Especially when the whole universe was just zeroing on the character of God. The whole universe was looking at God's character. Is he just or not? You think I just God gonna say, hey, come to me for when you come to me, then I'm gonna forgive you? No, that's not the character of God, that's how men think. And understanding what took place in heaven and the principles that are involved in the great controversy between good and evil, and how God was falsely accused by Lucifer as being unjust, take sins of God. How could how could a, a God that is a God that is good and a God that is love and a God that is just wait for you to first come to him before he can grant you forgiveness. When there's none that seeketh God, there's none that do it, God, no, not one. Oh, could mortal man be more just than God? That's the question, the great controversy. Or oh, will it just God Forgive us before we even think about repentance. For while you are his enemies, the fact that God is not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repent, the proof that he is a just God, saints of God. And he has justified all them who come unto him by Jesus Christ. So the next time we read John 3, 16, we can never ever read it the same. For it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed that God made the first move, whosoever believed that we have been forgiven, whosoever believed that we have been acquitted, whosoever believed that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law, whosoever believed that the condemnation has been removed, whosoever believed that we have been reconciled by him at the death of Christ should not perish but have everlasting life. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And when we present the gospel in the light of corporate forgiveness, it destroys the spirit of legalism. It destroys the spirit of the Pharisees. It destroys the works of the law. And simultaneously we are vindicating the character of God and declaring that God is just. 
It also gives the gospel power. Power to change lives. Power to overcome sin in our lives. Power to melt the stony hearts. It magnifies the name of Jesus Christ. It lifts up the law of Jesus. And the promise that will draw all men unto Christ. Amen. Sister Julian. Amen. How are you doing? Don't miss the word, sister. You see, when we present the gospel to only, when we only present the gospel to our first John 1 9 perspective, the sinner will always delay giving their heart to Christ. Because he or she feels that there's a work that they must do within themselves to be justified before they come to Christ. And from this stems the spirit of, I'm not ready. Maybe tomorrow. Right? Because they feel that they got to do something to make them say right before God. And Satan loves this because he knows that some will never ever come to Christ. It's a deception of the devil's sins of God. But when the sinner sees that he has already been acquitted and the condemnation has been removed and God has not holding the sin against them but he has he has held the son against his son. Hallelujah. Now the heart is open for the sinner to receive the Holy Spirit. Now the heart of the sinner is open for the Holy Spirit to do its work, saints of God. The heart is wide open to accept the love and the grace of Christ into the heart. And Satan's power will be broken and his kingdom cannot stand, saints of God. And to those who still don't believe that we were just, we're all were justified, let's see what the pen of inspiration says. I'm bringing this thing home now. <clears throat> to those who still don't believe, hear what the inspiration said. It was taught by the Jews that before God's love is extended to the sinner, he must first repent. So it's a deception of the devil to think that you got to first repent before you come to Christ. She says, in their view, repentance is a work by which men earn the favor of heaven. So here we see the spirit of salvation by works, even in our so-called repentance and sorrow for sin. It was thought, she said, and it was thought that, it was this thought that led the Pharisees to exclaim in astonishment and anger, this man received sinners. According to their ideas, he should, he, should, he should permit no one to approach him but those who repent. Now, if Christ wanted them first to repent, they could never come first to repent. They will never come around Christ. So the spirit of the Pharisees or, or, or the Pharisaism is to think that the sin was first repent before you can be justified before God or acquitted. But listen, she says, in the parable of the lost sheep, Christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after God, but God, but God, but seek after God, but through God seeking after us. So God is the one who made the first move, saints of God, and justified us and acquitted us, saints of God. We have been acquitted. Adam brought condemnation upon all. Let's think about it. When Adam sinned, we were still in his loins. And when God granted forgiveness, we were still in his loins. And to those who confidently teach that corporate forgiveness is heresy, I'm here to declare unto you that if this teaching is of men, it will come to nothing. That's right. You don't have to fight. You ain't got to do nothing. Just leave it alone. It's going to boil down to nothing. Thank That's you very right. much. <laughs> but, if, but, but, but if this teaching is of God, and I know it of God, you cannot overthrow it. You can't overcome it. You are kicking against the pricks and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's the goodness of the Lord 
that lead thee to repent. What Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary leads us to repentance. And likewise, our obedience to the law must be responsible to what Christ has accomplished for us all on the cross of Christ. So the dress reform and the health reform and the country living and prophecy must be Christ-centered. Christ must be lifted up because Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. What did he for? The message of the uplifted Savior and what Christ has done for us done on behalf of the human race, it is the heart of the three angels' message. The Lord in his great mercy has sent the most precious message to his people. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presents justification through faith and surety and inviting the people to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ which is made manifest by obedience to all of his commandments. We are declaring, by we declaring that God has forgiven all. We are declaring that God is holy. We are declaring that God is love, he is good. And we are declaring that God is just. We are vindicating the character of God. So we all in all, we owe it all to Jesus. And all to him we, we owe. Jesus paid it all. And all to him we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. Brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I sat back from years. In this church. I listened to both sides of the spectrum. I listened from the corporate. I listened from the first John 1 9. And I believe when we, when we dig into what caused the rebellion in heaven, it was all over this question. Is God a just God or not? And if God is a just God, what do you say when you come to me, I'm going to grant you forgiveness? Knowing that the whole universe was looking at God's character? Oh, will God forgive this sinner before he even come? I don't know about you, but I prefer to serve a God who, prefer, who forgives me before I even come. Because naturally, I won't come to him. So today, by the hearing of my voice, brothers and sisters, we are not, I'm not here to condemn no one. But I'm simply laying what God has placed on my heart. No, we, you know, some of us might disagree, some might, might agree, but all we got to do is go home and ask God, Lord, is this so? And ask God to really work in our hearts and see if this thing is true or not. Okay, if it is, brothers and sisters, it is the heart of the changes message. And because God has forgiven us, when we look at the cross and that God has forgiven us, then it's very easy for us to forgive others. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's very easy for us to love yes, each other. Very, very easy for us to embrace each other. Yes. Very easy for us to be patient with each other. Because yes, sometimes people get on our nerves. Yes. But we can be very patient with people, brothers Amen. and sisters. Amen? Amen? So today, my appeal is very simple. If we believe that God is just in all his ways, and he's a justifier of all those who come unto him to Christ Jesus, stand to your feet, let's pray. Pastor Peter's come pray for us.
Christ loves you and that he has died for your sins and has forgiven your sins and now is calling on you now to give your heart wholly to him so that he can purify you of sin yes he can remove the sin from your heart then beloved let's look to him in prayer yes. and thank him and ask him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves and shall we pray father we glory in the cross of christ we glory in your love for us we thank you for Jesus. Yes. We thank you for the life that he has given for us. We thank you, Lord, that Christ did not wait for us to come and repent and confess before he gave his life for us. 